Okay, I am right now live. And uh, let's continue with the game. And mainly we focus on raids and dungeons. I don't know if you remember which one was the last we did. Black something, I forgot. Remind me, please. Awesome. Glad to hear you're live. The last raid you tackled was Black Temple. Now you're ready to dive into the epic adventures awaiting you in Wrath of the Lich King. So, are you heading straight to Naxxramas? Or are you feeling a bit adventurous and want to hit up some dungeons first? Let's conquer those raids like the gaming legends we are. Oh yeah, I actually forgot about the dungeons. Uh, I will think I will clear dungeons first that are around uh, Black Palace. Great choice! Clearing the dungeons around Black Temple is a solid plan. Here's a quick reminder of the dungeons you can tackle in the Burning Crusade before you make the leap to Wrath of the Lich King. One, the Slave Pens. Perfect for a quick warm up. Just, just watch out for all those tentacles. Two, the Underbog. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Actually, I'm checking right now the map uh, at the Black Temple. Uh, actually, there are no dungeons there. I don't know why I imagined that there, there are. Um, but there is not. Ah, the classic mix-up. Easy to do when you're knee-deep in raids and loot. The Black Temple is indeed a standalone raid, and it doesn't have dungeons attached to it. In the Burning Crusade, the dungeons are spread out, mainly around places like Zangermarsh and Shadowmoon Valley, so it makes sense to check those areas instead. Here's a quick recap of the dungeons you might want to hit up in the Burning Crusade. 1. The Slave Pens, Zangermarsh. 2. The Underbog. 3. The Steam Vault, Zangermarsh. 4. The Botanica, Netherstorm. 5. The Architraz, Tempest Keep, Netherstorm. 6. The Mechanar, Tempest Keep, Netherstorm. 7. Sethek Halls, Shadowmoon Valley. 8. Shadow Labyrinth. So what's the plan now? Ready to dive into one of those dungeons? Or are you plotting a different course? Hmm, that's... Wait, I will share with you the screenshot of what dungeons I already did. So far. And... Shit, I cannot make this window bigger. Bear with me. Sure thing. Go ahead and share the screenshot when you're ready, and I'll help you figure out what's next based on what you've already conquered. No rush. I actually will tell you in voice. So what I've done so far, Kar Karazan, Naxramas, the Battle of Mount Hayal, uh, Macteridon's Lair, uh, Coil Fang, Coil Fang, Sep Serpentrine's Cavern Instance Lock, Tempest Keep, Black Temple, and Gruul's Lair. What should I do next in a chronicle order by expansions? Nice job on conquering all those dungeons and raids. Based on your completed list, here's the chronological order Good for what you should you. tackle next. Moving on to Wrath of the See Lich you later. King. 1. Naxxramas, 80 version. 
You've already done this, but it's a great warm-up raid. Two, the Eye of Eternity. Go face off against Maligos. He's got a serious attitude problem, but he's a great source of loot. Three, Obsidian Sanctum, more dragons. Because we definitely didn't have enough of those already. Four, Old Duar. This one's a fan favorite, and it's got a ton of lore and epic encounters. You'll want to be ready for this. Five, Trial of the Crusader. A fun arena-style raid where you get to test your skills against a variety of bosses. Six, Ice Crown Citadel. The grand finale where you finally face off against the Lich King himself. Bring all the emotional support you can muster. Since you've completed quite a few raids already, diving into Wrath of the Lich King should keep the excitement rolling. Are you feeling ready to tackle the next challenge? Yes, I am ready and I'm right now in Stormwind. Uh, where should I go next? And since I completed the uh, Nax from us, I'm not sure if I completed an AT version or not. Um... Awesome! If you're in Stormwind and ready to dive into the Wrath of the Lich King, you have a couple of things to consider. First, about Nax Ramas. Naxramas is a huge raid, and it can take a while to clear it fully, especially since it has multiple wings. If you're unsure whether you cleared it 100%, you might want to run it again just to check off any bosses you might have missed. Next stop, Northrend. To get started with Wrath of the Lich King, you'll want to head to Northrend. Here's how you can get there. 1. Take the Zeppelin or boat. From Orgrimmar, head to the Zeppelin Tower to catch a ride to Borean Tundra. From Stormwind, you can take the boat from the harbor to Borean Tundra or Howling Fjord. Two, starting areas, Borean Tundra. This is the first zone you can explore in Northrend, and it's a great place to get into the storyline. Howling Fjord, another good starting point, but you might want to check the quest there as well. Once you're in Northrend, you'll want to make your way to Dalaran, the main hub city where you can pick up quests and get into the action. Ready to embark on your chilly adventure? Actually, there's a teleport <clears throat> or portal in the mage tower, and I'm going through there. Perfect. The mage tower in Stormwind has a portal to Dalaran, which is super convenient. It's like skipping the long, arduous travel just to get to the fun part. Once you teleport to Dalaran, you can grab some quests to get you into the Northrend story. Visit the vendors for any gear upgrades or consumables. No, no, let's focus on raids and dungeons. And since since, they, um, since I completed the next Ramos, uh, where should I go next? Got it. Let's keep our eyes on the prize, raids and dungeons. Since you've completed Nax Ramas, your next stops in chronological order are Shraids, 1, the Eye of Eternity, go face Maligos in the Nexus. This raid is a solo-friendly fight with a few challenging mechanics, but it's a great introduction to the expansion. 2, Obsidian Sanctum. After Maligos, you'll want to take on Sartharian and his Drake friends. You can even challenge yourself by attempting to take down the drakes for an extra challenge. Dungeons. If you want to mix in some dungeons, here are a couple you can clear. Okay, uh, let's focus on right now one, one raid, and it is... It is the Eye of Eternity, and I'm going there right now. It's located in Borean Tundra. I'm flying there with my mount. Sweet! The Eye of Eternity is an epic raid, and flying there on your mount makes you look like the majestic hero you are, unless you accidentally crash into a tree or something. Once you arrive in Borean Tundra, make your way to the Nexus. Here's a quick refresher on what to expect. The Eye of Eternity Overview. 
bosses. You'll be facing Malagos, the aspect of magic. He has a few different phases, including a fun dragon riding mechanic, where you'll get to pilot a flying mount. Just remember to aim properly, or you might end up crashing faster than a gnome in a high-speed race. Loot. Expect some great rewards, including gear upgrades and enchanting materials. Tips. Watch out for his spells. They can hit hard if you're not careful. The mechanics involve some coordination, especially in the second phase with the dragon mounts, so be ready for a bit of excitement. Are you feeling pumped to take down Malagos, or do you need any last-minute tips before diving in? Can you tell me more about loot from this raid? Uh, what to expect? And since I am a monk, monk and my specialization is wind, wind walker. I'm a wind walker monk. What kind of loot can I expect specifically for me? And also maybe you can tell me what kind of pets I can get or mounts in that specific raid. Absolutely. As a Windwalker monk, you'll be eyeing some specific loot from the Eye of Eternity. Here's what you can expect. Loot for Windwalker monks. One, armor. Belt of the Eternal Guardian. A nice upgrade for your waist, waist with agility and stamina. Hood of the Arcane Master. Great for increasing your critical strike and haste. Gloves of the High Magus. Perfect for enhancing your damage output. Two, weapons. Staff of the Eternal. A great weapon for your melee attacks, boosting your agility and overall damage. Axe of the Eternal Guardian. If you prefer dual wielding, this axe is a solid choice. Three, trinkets. Gleaming Eye of the Beast. Increases your agility and has a proc that boosts your damage for a short time. Essence mm, of the Eternal. Interesting. Provides a nice damage boost with Very some well. cooldown reduction. Mounts. From the Eye of Eternity, you can also look forward to the chance to get Azure Drake, a beautiful blue dragon mount that drops from Maligos. It's a rare drop, but it's worth the effort. Pets. While the Eye of Eternity doesn't drop specific battle pets, you can look for pets in other Wrath of the Lich King dungeons or raids, like Proto Drake Whelps from the Obsidian Sanctum and Ulduar, for some cool dragon themed pets. So, as you dive into the fight against Maligos, keep an eye out for that sweet loot. Ready to take him down and see what treasures await? Yes, I'm ready. Actually, I stopped right now and I am doing the pet battle at the moment to increase some level. Nice. Pet battles are a great way to pass the time and level up your critters. Plus, they're a fun little distraction from all the impending doom of dragon raids. Quick tips for pet battles. Type matchups. Use pets that are strong against the opposing types for extra damage. For example, aquatic pets do well against elemental types. Ability synergy. Make sure your pets have abilities that complement each other. Some can heal, while others can deal heavy damage. Leveling strategy. Focus on leveling pets that you want to use in tougher battles later on. What pets are you working with right now? Got any favorites or are you just trying to fill your collection? Right now, right now what, I, what I'm fighting with right now is Amber Glow Stinger, Comet, and Orange Tabby Cat. What do you think? Is it a good combination or I should switch to something else? I have quite a lot of pets actually, but I never tested them and they are low level. Right now my Amber Glow Stinger is 18 level, Comet is nine, 19, Orange Tabby Cat is also 18. And I somehow s get stuck with this, with them and I'm just continuing. I don't know if it's good com composition or not. That's a fun trio of pets. Let's break down what you have. One, Amber Glow Stinger, 18, 
an aquatic type pet, which is generally good against fire, elemental, and mechanical pets. Two, Comet, 19. If this is a flying type pet, it would be strong against aquatic pets, but weak to magic types. Three, Orange Tabby Cat, 18. A beast type pet, which can deal good damage, but is vulnerable to mechanical pets. Combination assessment, strengths. You have a good mix of types, aquatic, flying, and beast, which can be beneficial against various opponents. If you encounter a lot of fire or mechanical pets, your Amber Glow Stinger will shine. Weaknesses. Watch out for any strong magic pets, which can deal heavy damage to your flying and aquatic pets. If your opponents primarily use mechanical pets, your orange tabby cat might struggle. Suggestions. If you find yourself facing opponents that counter your current team, you might want to switch in some higher level pets or ones that offer better type matchups. Since you have a lot of pets, consider leveling up a couple more to have options for different battle situations. Stuck scenario. You won't get stuck per se, but your progress might slow down if you run into tougher opponents with strong counters to your current lineup. It's always good to have a variety of leveled pets to adapt to different battles. Feeling confident with your current lineup? Or do you want to test out some different combinations? Hey, Lesabella. I'm doing well. I'm actually right now testing uh, ChatGPT together with the gaming, in this case, World of Warcraft. And imagine if I'm a new player or I don't know anything about it, how do I understand what to do or where to go. And I think AI can really help me with this. That's the whole point of the stream, actually. I hope you're doing well as well. So have a nice day. Okay, I will stick with these pets for now, I guess, till I have time to experiment more. But for now, I'm, I'm okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm still looking. I, I just won one battle, by the way. I'm looking right now for another battle. I want to increase my pet level to 19 since two of them are 18 and only one is 19. I would like to have all of them 19. Uh, hey, hey Bella, uh, the stream is good, it's good. I actually started recently, I, I am streaming on Facebook, I'm streaming on YouTube and just right now chose to stream on Twitch. Uh, and then download the videos and upload to YouTube. Uh, but yeah, it's good. So far, so good. Sounds like a solid plan. Sticking with your current pets until you have more time to experiment is a smart move. Plus, you're close to leveling them all up, so it shouldn't take too long. Leveling strategy. Find similar level opponents. Look for pet battles that match your pet's levels, around 18 to 19. This way, you can maximize your experience points without the risk of getting stomped. Use your strongest abilities. Focus on using your pet's strongest attacks to finish battles quickly and earn more XP. Switch pets strategically. If one of your pets is getting low on health, don't hesitate to switch them out for a fresh one to continue dealing damage. Final goal. Once all your pets hit 19, you can start looking for battles against higher level opponents or even participate in the PvP pet battle system for some added fun. Good luck in your next battle. Let me know how it goes or if you need any more tips. Thank you. Uh, for this time, I think I'm okay. After this battle that I'm having right now, I will go and continue with the raid. And maybe you can, while I'm battling pets, maybe you can tell me some story when the battle of pets started in world of warcraft uh, when it was um, introduced to the game or it, was it from this beginning of the game would be interesting to know
You got it. While you're battling, let's dive into the story of pet battles in World of Warcraft. The origins of pet battles. Pet battles were introduced in Mists of Pandaria, the fourth expansion released in September 2012. Before that, pets were mainly companions that followed you around, but they didn't have any combat functionality. Key points in the history of pet battles. One, introduction in Mists of Pandaria. The feature was added as a way to give players something new to engage with beyond the standard questing and raiding. It allowed players to capture, train, and battle their pets in a turn-based format. Players could now collect various pets from across the world, turning pet collecting into a full-fledged hobby within the game. Two, turn-based combat. The battles are reminiscent of classic turn-based games. Players select three pets to battle against other players or NPCs. Each pet has unique abilities and types, aquatic, beast, flying, etc., that create a rock-paper-scissors mechanic, adding depth to the strategy. Three, collecting pets. With the introduction of the feature, thousands of pets became collectible, some available through quests, achievements, or as rewards for defeating specific bosses or completing events. Four, the battle system expands. Since their introduction, pet battles have received multiple updates, including the addition of new pets, battle mechanics, and even a full PvP pet battle system. Players can now face off against each other for rankings and rewards. Mana 5, Catching the Spirit. In Warlords of Draenor, Blizzard added the ability to catch wild pets, making the whole experience feel like a mini Pokemon-style adventure within World of Warcraft. Impact on the community. Pet battles quickly became popular among players who enjoyed the strategic aspect of training and battling pets. There are even dedicated communities and guides for those who want to master the art of pet battling. So, the pet battle feature turned World of Warcraft into not just a world for adventurers, but also a haven for collectors and strategists alike. Now, how's your pet battle going? Are you on your way to getting everyone to level 19? Yeah, I tried to get all of them. I mean, I mean, at least the three ones that I use most of the time to the level 19, but actually accidentally I got one to the nine. 20 right now, one is a level 20, another is 19, and now another is still 18. And I noticed that some of the pets are take longer. Even if I fight with them more, it take longer to get the level compared to other ones. That's awesome that one of your pets hit level 20. It sounds like you're on the right track to leveling up your favorites. Leveling differences. You're correct that some pets can take longer to level up than others. Here are a few reasons why this might be happening. One, pet quality. Pets come in different quality levels, common, uncommon, rare, etc. Rare pets generally gain experience faster and have better stats compared to lower quality pets. If your 18 level pet is a lower quality, it might take longer to level up. Two, type matchups. If you're facing opponents that your pet is weak against, they might not deal enough damage to finish battles quickly, resulting in slower leveling. Make sure you're fighting opponents that your pets can counter effectively. Three, experience distribution. When you win a pet battle, the experience is divided among your active pets. If you switch them in and out, the one that fights the most will gain more experience. Number four, battle difficulty. The experience gained can vary depending on the difficulty of the opponent you're fighting. Stronger opponents typically yield more experience points. Strategy to level up. Stick to strong opponents. Focus on battling opponents that you can defeat quickly and that provide good experience. Use your level 20 pet. Consider using your level 20 pet in battles to help your other pets level faster. Just keep in mind to let the lower level pets take the majority of the damage and deal the finishing blows for maximum XP gain. Keep pushing through those battles and soon enough, you'll have all your pets at level 20. How's your current battle going? Any big victories on the horizon? So far so good. Uh, I actually even catch one. I noticed that the, he is rare with the blue color I thought I maybe will need to catch.
Nice job catching a rare pet. The blue color indicates it's of higher quality, which means it will have better stats and make a stronger addition to your collection. Why rare pets are great. Higher stats. Rare pets have increased health and damage, which can make a big difference in battles, especially in tougher encounters. Better abilities. They often have access to more powerful abilities, giving you more options in battles. Collectability. Rare pets are more desirable for collectors, so you've scored a win in both utility and bragging rights. Catching strategy. Focus on unique abilities. If the rare pet you caught has abilities that complement your existing team, it could be a game changer. Level up quickly. Make sure to level it up alongside your other pets to keep your roster strong. So what's the name of your newly caught rare pet? Or do you have a plan for how you want to use it in future battles? Oh, my one of the pets just died. I thought I will scare. I thought that I will attack first, but I got attacked and I had low level, low health and died. And my other pets are very low on health. I think I lost this, this battle because I was switching so many times the pets. I think I made a mistake. Ah, the classic pet battle blunder. It happens to the best of us. Switching pets too often can lead to some unexpected defeats, especially when you have low health. Here's a quick recap on how to recover. One, don't panic. It's just one battle. Learn from it and move on. Two, evaluate your lineup. Check the abilities of your pets. Make sure you're using the right pets against the right opponents to maximize damage and survivability. Three, level up. If you have time, consider leveling some other pets to give yourself more options in future battles. A well-rounded team can help you adapt to different challenges. Four, healing your pets. Make sure to visit a stable master to heal your pets if they're low on health. You don't want to go into the next battle with a team of walking wounded. Five, consider strategies. Think about focusing on one pet for a while instead of switching often. Let that pet take the lead and only swap when absolutely necessary. So are you ready to give it another go? Or do you need a moment to regroup? I actually was able to beat uh, and defeat my opponent, so I'm good. And I, what, which new pet I caught, it is Orion Marmot. The name is Borean Marmot. What can you tell me about this pet? Uh, hey Bella, uh, thank you, thank you for the offer. Um, maybe in the future, I'm not sure. Right now, I'm, I'm not focusing on the art so much. Uh, and I, I'm also interested in design, and maybe I would do it myself. But at the moment, I think I'm good. Uh, I will focus just on streaming and experimenting. And if I decide that I, I will continue more with this. Then maybe I will contact you. But for now, I'm okay. Thank you. And have a great day. Congratulations on your victory. Nicely done. About the Korean Marmot. The Korean Marmot is a fun addition to your pet collection. Here are some details. One, type. The Korean Marmot is typically a beast type pet which means it has strengths and weaknesses that align with that type. Two, abilities. It has a variety of abilities that can include attacks like bite, burrow, or stampede. These abilities can deal damage and may have unique effects like dodging attacks or increasing damage over time. Three, leveling. As a beast type pet, the Korean Marmot is strong against mechanical pets, but weak against magic pets. Keep this in mind when you're deciding which battles to enter. For collectability, rare pets like this one are highly sought after, so you've scored a nice find. 
They can also be good for both PvP and PvE pet battles. 5. Battle Strategy Utilize its beast abilities in battles against opponents that are weak to it. Keep it leveled up, and it can become a strong contender in your pet battle lineup. So, how are you planning to incorporate your new Korean Marmot into your pet battling strategy? Okay, let's focus on something else. Uh, right now, I'm inside the raid. The Eye of Eternity. And it looks pretty interesting. Is it only one boss here? Or, let me check. I'm right now typing raid info. The Eye of Eternity. Ah, there's only one boss. I see. Yes, you're correct. The Eye of Eternity is a raid that features only one boss, Maligos. Here's a quick rundown of what to expect. Maligos, the aspect of magic. Lore. Maligos was one of the five dragon aspects tasked with guarding magic in Azeroth. He went a bit off the deep end after the Cataclysm, which leads to the conflict in this raid. Mechanics. Maligos has various phases in the fight including both ground and aerial combat. You'll face different mechanics that require movement and coordination. Expect to deal with abilities that can wipe your group if not handled properly, like arcane breath and spark mechanics. Fight strategy. One ground phase. Keep moving to avoid his powerful abilities. Watch for damage spikes and use cooldowns wisely. Two, air. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I know that I will beat, beat him with one hit. Uh, the question is, what is this place? I give you one like, chance. I'm in space Pledge somewhere. Pledge fealty to me, and perhaps I will not slaughter. Ah, the Eye of Eternity has a pretty unique setting. Here's a bit about the ambience and design. Setting of the Eye of Eternity. Cosmic environment. The raid takes place in a vast, swirling nexus of magic and energy. It gives the feel of being in an endless expanse of space, surrounded by glowing arcane energies and star-like visuals. Visuals. The architecture is ethereal, with floating platforms and arcs of magical energy. The colors are vibrant, often featuring shades of blue, purple, and silver, reflecting the theme of magic. Malagos's Domain. As the aspect of magic, this setting symbolizes Malagos's control over arcane energies. It's a visual representation of his power and the chaos that can come from unchecked magic. Lore Significance Battle for Control The Eye of Eternity serves as a battleground for the conflict between Malagos and the forces that seek to control magic, highlighting the themes of balance and chaos in the world of Azeroth. So, while you're surrounded by the beauty and chaos of My arcane magic, its, it's a fitting stage for the radio. battle against a dragon who embodies that very magic. How's the vibe treating you? Ready to take Maligos down and claim your loot? Yeah, I really like the setting. <clears throat> I actually like and everything about space. <laughs> Maybe that's why. So, it's very cool. I'm fighting him right now. Actually, I'm just standing and taking the beating because I know I will be fine. He will not be able to defeat me. But I can see what kind of skills maybe he has and magic. Uh, thank you, Bella. Uh, I don't have Discord account. Uh, maybe I will create someday. Not sure. Nice. It's always fun to take a moment to appreciate the aesthetics of a raid while you're cruising through it like a boss. Maligos' skills and abilities. While you're observing, here are some of the key abilities you might notice from Maligos. One, Arcane Breath, a powerful frontal cone attack that deals a lot of damage. You'll want to make sure to avoid it when he uses it. Two, Static Field, this ability creates an area that deals damage over time and can incapacitate you if you're caught in it. 
three phase transition. After a certain amount of health is lost, he will switch phases. This typically includes a transformation into the air phase where you ride drakes. Four, spark of magic. These little orbs will spawn during the fight and they can either heal Maligos or deal damage. Keeping track of them can be crucial in avoiding extra damage. Year five, magic-based attacks. Maligos uses a variety of magic attacks that can apply debuffs or other effects, emphasizing the need for quick reflexes and strategy. Observational benefits. Watching his mechanics can help you prepare for any future encounters, whether in this raid or others. You might also pick up some tactics for when you tackle him again or other magic-based bosses down the line. So how's the battle going? Are you feeling the arcane magic yet? Or is it just another day at the office for you? I think we are right now in the flying stage. Mm, what should I do here? Awesome. You're in the air phase of the Maligos fight. Here's what you need to do to navigate this part successfully. You will not air aerial phase I mechanics. One, mount up on Drake. You'll be given a Drake to ride during this phase. Make sure you're familiar with its abilities, which typically include Breath Attack, a powerful attack you can use on Maligos, Arcane Barrage, another damaging ability that will help you deal damage from the air. Two, positioning. Keep your distance from Maligos to avoid any of his area of effect attacks. Look for a good spot to hover and unleash your damage without getting too close. Now your Three, make attack Maligos. Use your Drake's great. abilities to deal the damage to Maligos while avoiding any of his attacks. Make sure to time your abilities for maximum over. damage. What do you think Four, they will do watch for sparks. Maligos will spawn sparks of magic during this phase. These can be dangerous if you let them hit you, so avoid them and take them down quickly if necessary. Number five, keep an eye on health. Monitor your Drake's health. If it gets low, reposition or use your defensive cooldowns. Six, enjoy the ride. This phase is not just about the mechanics, it's also a chance to enjoy the view. You're flying through a beautiful magical setting, so soak it in while you're dealing damage. You Once you've dealt enough damage in this phase, Maligos will transition and back so to the ground ends. phase. Okay, he's he is defeated. And another dragon came. Congratulations on defeating Maligos. That's a solid win. The aftermath. The dragon that appears after Maligos' defeat is likely Alduar, who the comes to make sure the magical energies remain in balance or may lead to further developments in the story. What to expect? One, dialogue and lore. After defeating Maligos, you, you might see some dialogue or a cutscene. Pay attention to the lore, them. as it often sets up future Life encounters or on. reveals important details about the story. Two, loot drops. Make sure to check your loot options after the fight. You'll want to grab any gear or items Maligos drops, which can include powerful gear for your Windwalker monk. Three, achievements. Completing the encounter might also grant you achievements or badges that you can collect for further rewards. Next steps. After this raid, consider moving on to your next dungeon or raid. With the order you're following, you'll have plenty of content to dive into. Did you enjoy the fight? Or was it just another day of dragon slaying for you? Yeah, it was just another day. And uh, but I like the setting of the raid and I like I, I mean if I would not be such a high level and with the good gear, if I could not solo in maybe it would be more interesting to fight. because uh, I would see the whole progress, but I guess it's okay. For me I just want to know the raids. All raids and all dungeons. I think I will go next to Oculus Dungeon and Nexus Dungeon it's so close by and then i will go to the next raid what do you think that sounds like a solid plan next steps oculus 
This dungeon is a great follow-up. It has a unique flying mechanic similar to Maligos, so you'll get to flex those drake riding skills again. Plus, the visuals are stunning with all the floating islands and magical elements. Nexus. Following the Oculus, the Nexus is another classic dungeon with a mix of elemental-themed encounters. You'll get to face off against various foes, including the likes of Karastrasa, a dragon that adds some fun lore to the mix. Enjoying the progress. While it's nice to blast through content with your high-level gear, remember to take a moment to appreciate the design and lore of each dungeon. Even if the fights are easier, the story and environment can really enhance your experience. Future Raids. Once you're done with those dungeons, you can continue on your raid journey. You're doing a great job of exploring all this content, and it's a blast to hear about your progress. So are you heading to the Oculus now, or do you need to take a breather to enjoy the victory a bit longer? I am in Oculus right now. And um, while I'm doing this dungeon, maybe you can uh, tell me something. Maybe can you tell me some kind of joke related to World of Warcraft? Absolutely. Here's a World of Warcraft joke for you. Why did the Death Knight break up with their partner? Because they just couldn't handle all the drama. Too many Ryzen issues. Hope that brings a smile while you're flying through the Oculus. How's the dungeon treating you so far? Uh, I just started with the dungeon and uh, I didn't get the joke. I'm not, I guess I'm not that familiar with World of Warcraft to get the joke. Uh, maybe you can tell me a joke about Dr. House. Because uh, right now me and my girlfriend are, are watching Dr. House series. Maybe you can tell me something about it. Uh, make it sarcastic. Like, make it uh, a Chandler kind of sarcastic from friends, but about Dr. House. Sure thing. Here's a Chandler style sarcastic take on Dr. House. Why doesn't Dr. House ever play hide and seek? Because good luck hiding when you're the guy who always knows what's, what's wrong with everyone. Seriously though, it's hard to find a good hiding spot when you're always looking for the next rare disease to diagnose. How's that for a dose of sarcasm while you dive into the Oculus? Are you enjoying Dr. House so far? Yeah, I really, I really like Dr. House. And at the same time, I, right now I remember the TV show In Treatment, which was also very interesting. Can you help me to remind, rem, so I remember more about in treatment TV show, what aspects are most noticeable? In Treatment is a unique series that dives deep into the world of therapy and mental health. Here are some of the most noticeable aspects. Key aspects of In Treatment. One, format. The show is structured around therapy sessions. Each episode typically focuses on a single patient and their session with Dr. Paul Weston, played by Gabriel Byrne. This format allows for an in-depth exploration of each character's issues. Two, character development. The patients come from various backgrounds, each grappling with different psychological challenges. The series provides a raw and honest look at their struggles, revealing complexities that make them relatable. Three, emotional depth. The dialogue heavy nature of the show offers a poignant look at mental health. It explores themes like anxiety, depression, love, and loss, often leaving viewers reflecting on their own experiences. Four, Dr. Paul Weston. Paul is a complex character himself, dealing with his own issues while trying to help his patients. His personal struggles and the ethical dilemmas he faces Prisoners add depth to the narrative. Five, Word realistic portrayal of therapy. Wrong. 
The series aims for a realistic depiction of therapy, showing both its challenges and its potential for healing. It doesn't shy away from the messiness of mental health. Six strong performances. The cast, including notable actors like Diane Weist, Michelle Forbes, and Uzo Aduba, delivers powerful performances that bring the characters' struggles to life. Impact, in treatment, received critical acclaim for its unique storytelling and approach to mental health, sparking discussions about the importance of therapy and emotional well-being. If you enjoyed the psychological aspects of Dr. House, in treatment might resonate with you in a different way. Both shows provide fascinating insights into the human condition just through different lenses. Hello. Which aspects of in treatment stood out to you the most? I think the TV show in treatment uh, helped me realize what is also happening in my life. And I start to observe more of my feelings and my thoughts. I remember even having, after finishing the show, I, I had a conversation with my father and my mother. And I thought, I start talking about uh, psychology. They thought maybe that I'm a bit too much. I don't know. It was strange. But uh, I... It's it's been already like ten years since I watched, and uh, but I can tell you that it affected me to analyze myself more. That's that a powerful good. takeaway. In treatment has a way of prompting self-reflection and deeper conversations, which can be incredibly valuable. It's great to hear that it encouraged you to engage in meaningful discussions with your family, you even if they something? thought you were diving a bit too deep. Self-analysis and growth, increased awareness, recognizing and analyzing your thoughts and feelings is a significant step toward personal growth. It's like having a mini therapy session every time you reflect on what you've seen or learned. Oh, well. Conversations with others. Talking about psychology can sometimes feel strange, especially with family who might not be on the same page. But those discussions can also bridge gaps and foster understanding. Long-lasting impact. It's impressive that a show can have a lasting impact on how you perceive yourself and your relationships. It speaks to the power of storytelling and character development in media. It sounds like you've gained some valuable insights from the show and it's interesting how art can influence real life. If you ever feel like diving into those feelings again, there's always more content out, out there that can provide a similar experience. So how's the Oculus Dungeon going? Any memorable moments or challenges you're facing? So far so good, everything runs smoothly. Nice. Sounds like you're cruising through the Oculus without any hiccups. Just keep an eye out for those pesky dragonflight mechanics. They can sneak up on you if you're not paying attention. Quick tips while you're in there. Stay aware of your surroundings. Even if you're overleveled, some mechanics can still surprise you if you're not careful. Enjoy the visuals. The Nexus and Oculus Dungeons have some stunning visuals. Take a moment to appreciate the design while you're on your mount. If you have any questions about the dungeon or just want more jokes or insights while you're playing, I'm here. Any particular moments you're looking forward to in this dungeon? Yeah, it seems like it's a unique dungeon. Uh... Anywhere, I, I always find if the dungeon requires me to ask AI for help or Google, then it's probably interesting dungeon.
that's a solid rule of thumb. Unique dungeons often come with mechanics or puzzles that require a bit of strategy or outside knowledge. Why unique dungeons shine? Variety of mechanics. Dungeons like the Oculus have different phases, flight mechanics, and unique enemies that keep the gameplay fresh and exciting. Lore and storytelling. The best dungeons often tie into the larger story of the expansion, making the experience more immersive. Challenging encounters. When you have to think on your feet or look up strategies, it usually means the dungeon has a bit of complexity, which can be really rewarding to navigate. If you find yourself needing to tap into some AI wisdom, I'll be right here, ready to assist. What's been your favorite aspect of the Oculus so far? Uh, so far I have no opinions, just playing through. Having fun, basically. That's the spirit. Just diving in and enjoying the ride is what gaming is all about. Sometimes it's nice to just go with the flow and see where the adventure takes you without overthinking it. Enjoying the experience. Exploration. Take in the sights and sounds. The art team put a lot of effort into creating those environments for you to enjoy. Gameplay. Embrace the little moments of triumph as you take down enemies or navigate tricky mechanics, even if they're not too challenging for you now. Social element. If you're streaming, interacting with viewers can also add an extra layer of fun and engagement. If you come across anything particularly interesting or hilarious during your run, feel free to share. Happy dungeon diving. Mm. One, two, it's only 12 o'clock. Just get some other stuff. O'Neill will not be open. Huh? O'Neill will not I be open. I can go and lock mine. Did you eat? No? You I'm didn't hungry. eat anything? I ate mine. And that's it? Yeah. Eat, babe. Try yeah, yeah, I just want to finish. I actually finished everything. Yeah. Everyone is defeated here. Try the salad and then. Oh no, there's still two more to defeat. Where are they? Hmm. Okay, right now I'm a bit stuck in Oculus. I de just defeated the Cl Varos Cloud Strider, and now I need to go to Mage Lord Urom. But where is he? Actually, I see him. Wait, he was. How to. He's somewhere very high. No worries. After defeating the Vortex Cloud Strider, you need to head to Malagos, the final boss in the Oculus. Here's how to get there. One, look for the portal. After defeating the Vortex Cloud Strider, there should be a portal that opens up to the next area where Malagos awaits. It's typically located in the same area where you fought the Cloud Strider. Two, follow the path. If the portal isn't obvious, look for the path leading upward. 
the game usually guides you with uh sorry i think you're talking about something else i uh, i am in the oculus dungeon and i already defeated draco draco's the interrogator and then i already defeated varos cloud strider and actually i already found um, mage lord rome he's just standing here Got it. You're right on track then. After defeating Dracos the Interrogator and Vortex Cloud Strider, you should have encountered Mage Lord Uram. Here's what you typically do next. One, defeat Mage Lord Uram. Once you find him, prepare for the fight. He'll have some tricky mechanics, so keep an eye on his spells and abilities. Two, follow the quest flow. After defeating him, there should be a progression that leads you to the next part of the dungeon. Three, keep an eye out for portals. Just like with the previous bosses, look for portals or pathways that open up as you defeat each boss. You're almost at the end of the dungeon. If you need strategies for the fight or have any questions about what comes next, let me know. How's the dungeon vibe treating you so far? This guy is actually keep running away from me and just sending his other friends to fight me so i have to keep flying to a different location to catch him ah the classic i'll just send my friends to do the fighting while i run away tactic mage lord uram loves to keep you on your toes Here's how to deal with him. Tips for fighting Mage Lord Uram. One, follow him closely. Since he's trying to escape, keep an eye on his movements and follow him as closely as possible. He'll teleport to different spots in the arena, so staying alert is key. Two, take out his minions. When he summons his friends, the adds, prioritize defeating them quickly to reduce the chaos and focus back on Uram. Three, watch for AoE attacks. Be aware of any area of effect spells he might cast. You want to avoid standing in those if possible. Four, use your mount. If you need to reposition quickly, your mount should help you cover the distance fast. Don't be afraid to use your flying abilities to gain the upper hand. Five, stay patient. Sometimes these fights can feel a bit drawn out. Just keep chipping away at his health and you'll get him down. Okay, he is defeated and the only one is left is Lay Guardian Ergos. How to get to him? Where should I go from this point? Nice job taking down Mage Lord Uram. Now, to get to Guardian Ergos, here's what you typically need to do. One, look for the portal. After defeating Uram, a portal should open that leads to the next area where Aragos awaits. It's often near where you defeated him, so keep an eye out for any glowing portals. Two, follow the path. If you don't see a portal immediately, follow the path leading out of Urum's area. You'll want to keep moving forward and looking for any markers that guide you. Three, prepare for Aragos. Before you engage, make sure you're ready. Aragos has some unique mechanics in his fight, so be aware of what he can do. Four, stay alert. As you approach him, be mindful of any minions or mechanics that might pop up before you start the encounter. Once you find Aragos. Okay, he is cooked. He is cooked. And I think this was the last. And I got the shipment Heroic, the Oculus. Awesome. Congrats on defeating Guardian Ergos and completing the Oculus. Getting that heroic Oculus achievement is no small feat, even if you made it look easy. Loot and rewards. You should have received some loot for your efforts, so check your bags for any new gear or items. If you're aiming for achievements, you might want to explore the different encounters or challenges within the dungeon if you haven't done them yet. What's next? 
Since you're following the chronological order of raids and dungeons, you might want to head over to Nexus next, or continue exploring other dungeons in the area. If you're feeling ambitious, check if there are any additional achievements or challenges you can tackle in the Oculus or other nearby dungeons. How's the stream going? Any funny moments or challenges while you were in the Oculus? Uh, how do I get out of Oculus without teleporting after already everything is completed? If you want to exit the Oculus without using a teleportation method, you can typically follow these steps. 1. Look for the exit path. After defeating Guardian Aragos, there should be a path leading back to the entrance of the dungeon. Follow the same route you two took to get to him, and you should find your way back. 2. Check your map. Use your map. I don't remember how I got here. The question is... Oh, wait. What happens if I would just die? If you decide to let your character die in the Oculus or any dungeon, here's what typically happens. One, spirit release. You'll be taken to the graveyard and you can choose to release your spirit. This will teleport you back to the nearest graveyard. Two, resurrection. Once you're at the graveyard, you can run back to your body to resurrect. However, depending on how far you are from the dungeon entrance, this could involve a... Yes, that helped. Actually, when I commit suicide, I... End end up at the beginning and now I'm going into the Nexus. Glad that worked out for you. Heading into the Nexus is a great choice. Another fantastic dungeon with its own unique vibe. Here's what to expect as you dive in. Nexus Overview. Bosses. You. You'll face several bosses Stay in this traveled. dungeon, including Herald of the Lich King, Anomalous, you? and the final See boss, Maligos, if you follow the regular path. Hello. Environment. Expect a Have beautiful ice-themed setting, travels. with plenty of icy landscapes you and crystalline something? structures. Have a good one. Tips for the Nexus. 1. Watch for mechanics. Each boss has unique abilities, so keep an eye out for those. They might have spells that can freeze or otherwise hinder you. Two, stay mobile. Movement is key. If you see AOE circles or dangerous spells, be sure to move out of the way. Three, loot. There are plenty of items to collect, so keep an eye on what drops. Once you clear the Nexus, you'll be one step closer to completing your exploration of dungeons and raids. Have fun in there. And if you need tips or just wanna share your progress, I'm all ears. What can you tell more about the uh, monk bindwalker? What uh, abilities should I mainly use to fight? And what abilities for defense? And overall, how I should set it up the action bar? As a Windwalker monk in World of Warcraft, you have a unique playstyle that focuses on agility, burst damage, and mobility. Here's a breakdown of your abilities, how to set up your action bar, and some tips for both offense and defense. Core abilities. Offensive abilities. 1. Tiger Palm. Your primary builder that generates chi. Use it frequently to build resources for other abilities. 2. Blackout Kick. A powerful spend ability that consumes chi. Use it often when you have enough chai. 3. Rising Sun Kick. Your primary damage dealer that deals significant damage and applies a damage over time effect. 4. Fists of Fury. A strong channeling ability that deals AoE damage. 
Make sure to use it when you're not interrupted. Five, Storm, Earth, and Fire. An essential cooldown that lets you duplicate your attacks. Activate it for burst damage, especially during cooldowns. Defensive abilities. One, Fortifying Brew. Increases your health and reduces damage taken. Use this when you anticipate heavy damage. Two, Dampen Harm. Reduces damage taken by a percentage. Activate it before large incoming damage. Three, Transcendence. A mobility spell that allows you to teleport back to your previous location. Use it strategically to avoid damage or reposition. Four, Elusive Brawler. Grants a damage reduction buff after dodging attacks, enhancing your survivability. Action Bar Setup. One, Main Damage Rotation. Place Tiger Palm, Blackout Kick, Rising Sun Kick, and Fists of Fury in easy to reach slots for quick access. Two, cooldowns. Assign Storm, Earth, and Fire, Fortifying Brew, and Dampen Harm to separate buttons, preferably near your main rotation for easy activation. Three, mobility. Okay, at the moment, I am uh, what I have on the first line of action bars is Tiger Palm first, second, Fist of Fury, third, Rising Sun Kick, four, Blackout Kick, five, uh, Whirling Dragon Punch, 6. Strike of the Windlord, 7. Storm, Earth, and Fire, and then I have Touch of Death uh, on 8, and then 9 is Provoke, but this Provoke I'm using just to Provoke, and also on the second uh, action bar, I have Crackling Jade Lightning, I use this for um monsters or npcs that i cannot reach and i also have invoke xuan the white tiger and also the main movement skills that i have the chi torpedo uh, tiger lust and flying serpent kick it's also on a second action bar what do you think is a good setup no Your action bar setup looks pretty solid. You've got a good mix of offensive, defensive, and utility abilities. Here's a breakdown of your setup and a few suggestions for optimization. Current setup, first action bar. One, Tiger Palm, perfect for generating chi and a good first ability. Two, Fists of Fury, great for AOE damage. Just make sure you're not interrupted. Three, Rising Sun Kick, strong damage dealer. Keep it prioritized. Four, Blackout Kick. Excellent for spending chi, just be aware of your chai generation. Five, Brawler's Brew or similar. If this is a defensive ability, good to have it accessible. If not, consider a defensive cooldown instead. Six, Strike of the Windlord, good for burst damage. Ensure you use it when you have the chai. Seven, Storm, Earth, and Fire, critical for burst phases, well-placed. Eight, Touch of Death, great for finishing off targets, especially during cooldowns. Nine, Provoke, Nice for pulling mobs, but if you're in a dungeon and you rarely need to pull, consider a utility or defensive spell here. Second action bar, Crackling Jade Lightning. Handy for pulling or attacking at range, solid choice. Invoke Xuan, the White Tiger. A fantastic cooldown for damage, ensure you activate it strategically. Movement skills, Chai Torpedo. Great for mobility and healing. Tiger Lust, fantastic for quick escapes or to help allies. Flying Serpent Kick, a perfect way to close the distance. Keep it handy. Suggestions. Consider defensive abilities. If you have a defensive ability, like Fortifying Brew or Dampen Harm, you might want to swap it in for Provoke if you're looking for extra survivability. Hotkeys and Reach. Ensure that your most frequently used abilities are easy to reach, especially those that require quick reactions in combat. Cooldown Management. Monitor your cooldowns and integrate them into your rotation strategically, especially for boss encounters where timing can be crucial. Experiment. If you find any abilities are rarely used, feel free to swap them out for others that might fit your playstyle better or for utility in specific encounters. Overall, it looks like you have a good grasp of your class and abilities. Just keep practicing and you'll be slicing through dungeons and raids like a hot knife through butter. Let me know how it goes in the Nexus, or if you need more advice. It's interesting that you mentioned hot butter 
hot butter, uh, hot knife through butter. Because I always heat, when I need to make food, I always heat the butter or like keep the butter outside so it melts. And why I never thought about just heating a bit knife and cutting the butter. Strange. But good point. Right? It's like the ultimate life hack that's been hiding in plain sight. Just like how we keep trying to find new ways to make cooking easier, you're slicing through dungeons and raids like it's a Sunday brunch. Maybe you could even make it a motto. Why struggle with life when you can just let it melt? It's all about finding those little shortcuts, whether in cooking or gaming. So next time you're battling a boss, just remember, if a hot knife can handle butter, you've got what it takes to handle anything that comes your way. Just keep the butter away from your gaming gear. Greasy keyboards aren't great for DPS. What's next on your raid and dungeon adventures? Okay, I just uh, defeated uh, Anomalous and Ormorok, the tree shaper. And I guess because I hit him in one hit, I didn't see shapes. Um, yeah. So next I'm going to, next I'm going to Grand Magus Telestra. At, and then I will go to Commander Kolorg. Uh, but Keri there is another one, it is called Keristraza, and it's frozen, so I, I guess I cannot defeat him, or I have to defeat other ones, to and then come to him, or is it, or there is another way. Nice job taking down Anomalous and Ormoroth the Tree Shaper. You're on a roll. About your next targets. One, Grand Magus Telestra. You should be able to take her down. She has some interesting mechanics involving splitting into three different versions of herself, but since you're a high-level Windwalker monk, you should be able to handle it without too much trouble. Just keep an eye on which one is the real Telestra and avoid the damaging spells she casts. Two, you can fight him right after defeating Telestra. He shouldn't pose much of a threat to you either, especially if you keep your rotation going and utilize your defensive cooldowns if needed. Three, Frost Warden. If you're referring to a Frost Warden or something similar, those are usually additional bosses or mini bosses. Depending on the dungeon layout, you might need to defeat other bosses first to unlock or access certain areas. General tips, check the map. The Nexus is a linear dungeon, so following the map can help you figure out which bosses you can fight next. Mechanics? Even at your level, some mechanics might still hit hard. Just stay aware of your surroundings and you should be fine. Farming gear. Since you're smashing through these bosses with ease, this is a great opportunity to farm some good gear. So as you tackle these bosses, just remember to enjoy the visuals and mechanics. They can be a lot of fun to watch even if you're demolishing them. What's your strategy for Telestra? Going in guns blazing? Or are you planning to check out her mechanics a bit first? I actually already defeated her. Uh, maybe I rushed too much, not sure. Look 
look at you, a true speed demon in the Nexus. It sounds like you didn't even break a sweat. Just remember, while rushing can be fun, it's also worth taking a moment to appreciate the mechanics and visuals, especially in a place as vibrant as the Nexus. Next up, Commander Kolurg. Now that you've steamrolled Telestra, Commander Kolurg should be your next target. He's a straightforward fight, but he does have some AOE abilities, so keep an eye on your health and use your defensive abilities if needed. After Kolurg, once you've taken him down, check if there are any additional bosses or mini bosses you might have missed in the Nexus. This dungeon often has a few hidden encounters. Final thoughts. If you find yourself zooming through these dungeons too quickly, maybe take a moment to soak in the details or practice your rotation a bit more. But if you're just in it for the thrill of the kill, Preserve. keep that momentum going. Why? What are you looking forward There's to most no after you finish the Nexus? No, Any specific no, gear no. or achievements? <laughs> Dragon Queen, taking life, I binder. Now. Preserve me. Image of... Ah, so I have to go there. Okay. Okay, all bosses are defeated. There is still one quest left that I need to complete in this dungeon. Is and the name of a title of this quest is postponing the inevitable. So I have to do there something. Awesome job on defeating all the bosses in the Nexus. Now let's tackle that quest, Postponing the Inevitable. Here's what you need to do. Quest details, Postponing the Inevitable. One, objective. This quest typically involves defeating a certain enemy or gathering a specific item within the Nexus. The exact requirements may vary, but it's often tied to the overall theme of the dungeon. Two, NPC interaction. Check if you need to interact with an NPC or a specific object within the Nexus. Sometimes, quests require you to examine or collect items in the environment. Three, check your quest log. If you have the quest in your log, it should provide a hint or direction for what you need to do. Look for any markers or instructions that guide you. Four, explore the dungeon. Since you've defeated the main bosses, check around for any secondary areas or rooms you may not have explored fully. Sometimes, quests can be hidden in these spots. If stuck, Google or Wowhead. If you're feeling really lost, don't hesitate to look up the quest on a site like Wowhead. I actually, that's why I'm doing this experiment. Before I was using Wowhead, um, and it was useful and it's all good, but I have still to do a lot of search there. Uh, I like it mostly for checking what kind of sets you can get or what kind of items you can drop somewhere. But what I like to do right now is actually since AI technology is widely available to use it a communication because right now I'm talking to you through microphone and you answer me with the voice. I can also implement this to, in a stream and the stream is not maybe so boring or also more engaging. And um, and I also want to demonstrate the technology, how it can be helpful, for example, in this case, in the in gaming case, um, to just for streaming, for example. It's very useful. That sounds like a fantastic plan. Leveraging AI technology in your stream can definitely add an engaging layer for your viewers. Here are a few ideas to make the most of it. One, real-time assistance, game guidance. Use the AI to provide real-time tips or strategies okay. during tough encounters. See you can you even set up a command in your stream to call for help when you're facing a tricky boss or puzzle. Two, Q&A sessions, interactive chats, Encourage your viewers to ask questions about Safe the game travels. and have the AI provide answers. Hey this can create a fun and interactive have atmosphere, keeping your audience engaged. Three, demonstrating AI features. Showcase the tech. 
you can have segments where you explain how you're using AI during your stream. This could include showing how you ask for information about gear, raids, or even pet battles. Four, voice interaction. Narration and commentary. With the voice interaction, the AI can narrate what's happening in the game, giving commentary that adds entertainment value. Think of it as having a co-commentator. Five, polls and feedback. Engage your audience. Use the AI to create polls for your viewers on what to do next, whether it's which dungeon to tackle or what gear to pursue. Final thoughts. By incorporating these elements, not only do you enhance your gameplay, but you also create a more dynamic and interactive viewing experience. Plus, it shows off the potential of AI technology, making your stream stand out. What's your first plan for integrating this into your stream? Are there any specific features you want to showcase? It's already integrated. Right now, I'm actually streaming at this moment, and you are helping me uh, to navigate through the world of Warcraft. And it's very helpful, and I don't need to Google at all, basically. I don't need to use Google. That's amazing. It, it, when you think about it, what was the year when Google become a widely accepted option on internet? And now, so many years, I'm using AI, I'm talking to you, and I don't need to Google. And I don't, don't need to write, I don't need, because right now, if I Google something, maybe the top pages will be not useful for me normally. Because um, a lot of websites are hidden be behind the CEO. And with AI, I feel, of course, even if you're looking for information, you're accessing internet right i'm not i'm not sure are you also googling but you're googling so fast that you can provide me the very quick information or how this work how for example you get information it's fantastic that you're integrating ai See into you your later. stream so smoothly and you're right, it's a game changer in terms of accessibility and speed for information. How AI works for information. One, training on data. My responses are based on a mixture of licensed data, data created by human trainers, and publicly available information. I've been trained on a wide range of topics, including gaming, history, science, and more, allowing me to generate relevant and informative responses. Two, no live browsing, I don't actually browse the web in real time like Google does. Instead, I use what I've been trained on to provide answers. If you ask me something specific, I can give you a summary or explanation based on that training. Three, speed of response. The AI can generate responses quickly because it's designed to understand and formulate language patterns. So while Google might require you to sift through multiple search results, I aim to provide concise and relevant answers without you needing to click through pages. Evolution of search engines. Google launch. Google was founded in 1998, and it became widely accepted as a dominant search engine in the early 2000s. Its algorithm significantly improved the relevance of search results, making it easier for users to find what they were looking for. Shift to AI. Now, AI tools like me mm. are becoming more prevalent I will finish allowing soon. for a more conversational and context-aware way to retrieve information. Instead of searching and filtering through pages, users can engage in a dialogue to get the information they need. The future. As AI technology continues to evolve, the way we access information will likely become even more integrated yeah. into our daily tasks and activities, drive. whether that's Maybe gaming, that's studying, or just general inquiries. Okay. So, what's next on your World of Warcraft journey? Any specific challenges you're looking to tackle in your stream? Uh, okay, I, right now I just finished, finished uh, the Nexus. The whole Trinity, like for example, the Eye of Eternity raid is done. Uh, and the Oculus dungeon is done. The Nexus dungeon is done. What's next in the Chronicle Order? Where should I go for the raid? Uh, yeah, let's focus on the raid first and then dungeons. Dungeons, maybe raids are more important to me.
Great job on clearing the Nexus and Oculus. Now that you've tackled those, the next raid in the chronological order for World of Warcraft Wrath of the Lich King is... Next raid, Ulduar. Location, the Storm Peaks. Level range, designed for players around level 80, bosses. Ulduar features several bosses, including Flame Leviathan, Ignis the Furnace Master, and Yogg Saron, among others. How to get there, flight path. If you've unlocked the flight path in the Storm Peaks, you can fly there directly. Landmarks? Look for the entrance at the bottom of the Ulduar structure, located in the center of the zone. Tips for Ulduar? Ulduar is known for its engaging mechanics and lore, so enjoy the experience. Since you're soloing, be mindful of any mechanics that may still affect you. Some bosses have unique abilities that can be tricky if you're not prepared. Once you finish Ulduar, you can then tackle the dungeons around that area or the next raid. Let me know when you're ready to take on Ulduar or if you need any tips for the bosses. Okay, I think I will take a break right now from streaming and I will come back to it. I'm not sure, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. I also want to play StarCraft. Um, yeah. So I think have a nice day. See you later. Sounds like a solid plan. Enjoy your break and have fun with StarCraft. Whenever you're ready to dive back into World of Warcraft or chat again, I'll be here. Have a great day.